This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of South St. Paul on this, the fifth Sunday of Lent and day two of the Minnesota executive order to stay at home until at least April 10th. I want to thank all of you who have been watching our worship services on Facebook and YouTube, the hundreds of views that we have been receiving and the wonderful comments and the shows of gratitude have been uh, really well received by your pastors and your staff. So thank you for that. I did wanna let you know of some of the updates about our church and all that we are doing. As you know, back uh, a few weeks ago, the session decided to close the building and to cancel all events and activities, including our worship services, uh, until they could meet again at their March session meeting and, and uh, make future decisions. So we met this past Thursday and to let you know that the uh, session has decided to keep the building closed uh, through the end of April to be reevaluated at the April session meeting uh, although we will continue to be looking at all of the uh, best information that's coming out and what the uh, uh, advice and orders coming from the state and health officials actually are. Uh, we are still having virtual meetings, lots and lots of virtual meetings. Uh, we're having our study groups and uh, our even the youth group met last Wednesday night uh, using this, the Zoom platform. And we hope to be adding some types of fellowship activities onto Zoom uh, in the uh, coming days. Uh, we want to thank the Board of Deacons and all of the volunteers who have been uh, really taking care of our congregation over these uh, last couple weeks with phone calls and with notes uh, and just keeping ourselves connected at a time when we really could slip into uh, isolation and solitude, uh, which might be good for some people, um, but to stay connected with one another. Uh, and so we're uh, continuing to do that. If you know of someone who you think could use a phone call uh, or you yourself could use a phone call, uh, please let Pastor Katie or myself know, or you could let Phyllis Hahn, she is kind of running this uh, particular program through the Board of Deacons uh, for us. And uh, the more we can stay connected, absolutely the better. And finally, a reminder uh, that we are still collecting offering, even though we're meeting virtually. Uh, you can send in your offering through the mail. Uh, we've just put in a uh, locked mailbox outside of the front door of the church. Someone is checking on that regularly. Uh, and so if you're an essential worker and are out and want to uh, drop your uh, offering into the box, uh, please know that that is uh, uh, a possibility for you and that it is very secure. Otherwise, on the uh, church website, there is a donate button that will take you uh, to a page that will allow you to uh, make your offering electronically as well as uh, any number of different designated giving opportunities. You can do the same thing through the Vanco Give Plus app. And that will allow you to, again, be very specific in your giving, uh, given that it's March food share, soon to be also April food share. It gives you the opportunity to give to neighbors, as well as the one great hour of sharing offering that is coming up. You would click on the mission button, and then it would give you an opportunity later to uh, write in the memo spot exactly what mission project you want that money to be going to. Finally, uh, something that I read on the internet the other day that I wanted to share with you. It says, churches are not being closed. Buildings are being closed. You are the church and you are to remain open. We are the church and we will remain open. Let us begin our time of worship together with a moment of centering silence.
Let us continue to call ourselves to worship. Coming from places that have seen better days. God bids us to celebrate this day, a day full of new possibilities. Coming with our breath, taken away by grief. The Holy Spirit breathes new life into us. Renewing our connection with God and with one another. Coming to worship, seeking a hope that will endure. Christ unbinds the fetters that hold us in death, calling us to new life and building community for holy service. Please join me in the opening hymn, God of Compassion and Mercy. Friend us. Friends, we are separated, not just by the social distancing we are cautioned to participate in, but also by the ways we are separated from God and from one another, by the things we've done and not done, by our own sinful nature. And so we pray for God's forgiveness. Will you join me? Merciful God, whose care never ceases, we come to you as we are. We are tired from trying to do more than we can manage. We are anxious about problems which go unresolved. We are worried about events beyond our control. We do not easily let go. For mistakes we cannot redeem, for tasks left undone, for uncertain goals, we need your forgiveness and ask for your understanding. For recovery of strength and enthusiasm, we pray for your spirit. For fullness of life, generous hearts, and contented souls, we pray to be followers of Jesus. In your mercy, restore us and lead us. Amen. Join us now in the assurance of God's grace. We know who God is by the love shown to us in Christ Jesus. We will show others who we are and whose we are by the love poured out through our lives. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Would the children join me around the screen now for our special time together in the service? I'm trying 
very hard right now to imagine all of you here. I can see, uh, I can see Rachel and Natalie off to my left, trying to hide behind the piano. Uh, and I can picture Abby laying across the floor and Emerson and Crosby uh, sitting in their mother's lap right in front of me. I can see Cecilia and Addie and Ellie. I can see Piper and Zoe also over here to my left and Khaleesi and Ethan and Olivia, Malia and Brendan. I can see Greta and Avery on one side or the other of me. I can see uh, Manny and Thomas. It is all right there in my imagination. I can see you all so clearly here. Wanted to let you know that both Pastor Katie and I and Miss Linda miss you all terribly and hope that you are all doing well. Hope that you're finding ways uh, to keep yourself busy before you all, uh, I suppose, begin some sort of online schooling uh, this week. I know when I've been out walking uh, in my neighborhood, a number of the children in the neighborhood have taken it upon themselves to take sidewalk chalk and in all sorts of colors to draw flowers and beautiful pictures and to put inspirational uh, sayings on the walk so that as we walk along, we're seeing that the kids in the neighborhood are wishing us well and are including us in their prayers and letting us know that um, they love us. And if you all are doing those same things, I just wanna tell you uh, for those of us adults walking down the street, it means so much. And so we are so grateful for you. Uh, if you have not heard of this as well, there's a program uh, called Hearts in the Window, uh, where people are cutting out hearts, here's mine, and uh, filling their windows uh, with these hearts so that um, essential workers in your neighborhood uh, will be able to see some joy uh, on their way to work and on their way uh, coming home from work. So if that is something that you uh, are doing, will do, if you're, doing, uh, if you're writing things with sidewalk chalk, uh, see if you can have someone in your household uh, take a photo of that and send it to the church. We would love to be uh, posting them for everyone to see. But now I have a very special guest for all of you. Mr. Bill, are you there? Mr. Bill. Hello, Pastor Tom. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> we have a, a song that's uh, very familiar to a lot of you kids. I hope you'll join along. I got a joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I got a joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Yeah, I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I've got a love for all people down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got a love for all people down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Yeah, I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Okay, all you preschool graduates, you know who you are. Amelia, Kate, Mabel, Thomas, Zoe and Piper, Robbie and Rachel, <clears throat> Amal and Abby, Joey and Teddy, Sydney and Greta, Anna and Aaron, Joaquin, Benicio, Manny, <clears throat> Sean and Grace, Rachel and Nat, Natalie, Toby and Tucker, Christopher and Abby, Cece Bell, Kyle, Tanya, Ethan, Malaya, Avery and Sarah. <clears throat> and all you kids that we never had the chance to work with because you were too young, Ellie and 
Patty, Emmy, and Crosby. You know what to do. And if the bully doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack. If the bully doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. Ouch! Sit on attack. To stay. And I'm so happy. So very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy. So very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Thank you, Mr. Bill. And now kids, will you pray with me? Repeat after me, dear God, we are so grateful for you. Thank you for our many blessings. Help us to be a blessing to others. And all God's children said, Amen. Now our anthem from our own choir, uh, singing Linda Cockelmeyer's composition, Keep Us Whole. Oh. 
friends, as we prepare ourselves to hear the word of God, let us join together in our prayer for illumination. Enfold us this day, O God, in a love that we cannot help but share. Speak to us with a fresh and vital revelation that we may dwell in your love and reveal it in lives of faithfulness and praise. Amen. Our scripture reading for this day is from the Gospel of John in the 11th chapter. We'll be reading the first 45 verses, so I've asked a few people to assist in this reading. Listen carefully for the word of God to us this day. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are not there twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring to merely sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary, and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, 
my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? We're all pretty bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it, that's all. These are quotes from the classic John, Hill's, John Hughes film, The Breakfast Club, that was released in theaters 35 years ago last month. Along with these lines and many other nuggets of wisdom, is one that has become a Watson family maxim. Screws fall out every day. The world's an imperfect place. The entire film takes place during one particular Saturday detention, detention session at Shermer High School in the fictional town of Shermer, Illinois. Now, I was born in 1966, and so I was 19 years old when the movie came out. I had just graduated from high school the previous June and saw the film for the first time nine months later at a little neighborhood theater in Evanston, Illinois, where I was a freshman at Northwestern University. The movie spoke to me and to many others of my generation, just as it continues to speak to students of the same age three and a half decades later. I saw it multiple times in my 20s. Then as a church youth director and associate pastor of children, youth, and families, I probably saw it another two dozen times at lock-ins and retreats, and that's a conservative estimate. When my own children were old enough, I watched it with them, and as my three grandchildren seem to be aging exponentially, it feels like it won't be long before I am watching it with them as well. One of the quotes that particularly rings true for me and I assume for others of us is spoken by the character John Bender when he says of spending his Saturday captive in the school library, there's nothing to do when you're locked in a vacancy. But for those of you who feel like you have been or currently are locked in a vacancy, there is at least one thing that you can do. If you have never seen the classic John Hughes films of the 1980s or haven't seen them in a while, this is the perfect time to binge watch yourself some 16 Candles, Pretty in Pink, Uncle Buck, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and 
then finish it up with the iconic The Breakfast Club. There are worse ways to spend time locked in a vacancy. Just ask John Bender. For those of you like me who may be enjoying all the brilliantly creative and imaginative homemade videos on the internet the past couple weeks, who knew that all we needed was a pandemic to find out just how truly talented we all are? As well as the, <coughs> as well as the hysterically honest posts and memes all over social media, there was one taken from the Be Breakfast Club that hit home with me. It is a photo of the detention teacher, Mr. Vernon, and parodying his words to make them about the current health and economic crisis, it reads, keep complaining about the quarantine and you just bought yourself another month. You wanna keep going, pal? I can do this all 2020. Let's hope not. Though I think my favorite post meme so far is, I'm kind of starting to understand why pets try to run out of the house when the front door opens. Now all these are fun to read and give me a smile or a laugh when I really, really need it. And I love the videos that remind me of just how amazingly talented we all are. Or at least that one daddy and daughter, Matt and Savannah Shaw from Utah. Seriously, you have to check them out. But sometimes we just need to pull ourselves away from our screens and get outside and take a safe six foot distance walk through the neighborhood. So that's exactly what Lisa and I did. And just like many of you who have shared stories with me of your own neighborhood journeys and adventures, we have all discovered that we had no idea there were so many dogs that lived on our blocks. Neighbors we haven't seen in decades who we just assumed who had moved away to bigger backyards or warmer climates. As the two of us made our way down the street, we noticed that in many places, you could see tulips and crocuses popping up through the frozen ground next to the last of the dwindling dirty snow piles. Rarely do meteorological spring, March 19 this year, match up with actual visible spring in Minnesota. But this year, knock on well sanitized wood, may just be the exception. Overwhelmed by the news of the virus spreading across the world, hundreds of thousands testing positive, and over 27,000 fatalities, now over 1,000 just in this country, and the economic crisis that results from it, the stock market plummeting, businesses closing, unemployment claims at an all-time high, and then again, just this week, Governor Walls announcing an executive order for non-essential workers to stay home for two weeks. I had missed, maybe you did as well, that spring arrived. Winter appears to be over, or at least coming to an end. Spring is an amazing time. Metaphorically, symbolically, poetically, religiously, it is a time of new life of life springing forth from the cold, barren slumber of winter or resurrection. It is a reminder that the abundant beauty and fertility of life, even when it seems so distant and remote, gone, never to return, is the most powerful force in the entire universe. Life goes on. Even Lazarus, dead, really and truly dead for four days, is capable of new life when encountered by the divine power of God in the person of Jesus. Life goes on. 45 verses that cover multiple days, but the most important part of the story isn't even there, is missing. And that is, what happened next? What happens next? What does Lazarus do with his new life? All we know is that he is alive and that he must be unbound, unbound from his old grave clothes, that, his, that our old behaviors, old habits must be removed for new life to truly begin. Offered the gift of new life by the amazing grace of God, 
what will be our choices? Will we choose new life? Will we have the courage to unbind ourselves, to remove the old grave clothes that held us back from this new life? In his New York Times column this week, The Moral Meaning of the Plague, David Brooks tells that author Viktor Frankl, writing from the madness of the Holocaust, reminded us that we don't get to choose our difficulties, but we do have the freedom to select our responses. According to Frankel, meaning comes from three things. The work we offer in times of crisis, the love we give, and our ability to display courage in the face of suffering, compassion. Brooks writes, I'd add one other source of meaning. It's the story we, story we tell about this moment. It's the way we tie our moment of suffering to a larger narrative of redemption. It's the way we then go out and stubbornly live out this story. The plague today is an invisible monster, but it gives birth to a better world, a new life. This particular plague hits us at exactly the spots where we are weakest and exposes exactly those ills we had lazily come to tolerate. We're already a divided nation and the plague makes us distance from one another. We define ourselves too much by our careers and the plague threatens to sweep that away. We're a morally inarticulate culture and now the fundamental moral questions apply. In this way, the plague demands that we address our problems in ways we weren't forced to before. The plague brings forth our creativity. It's during economic and social depressions that the great organizations of the future are spawned. Brooks writes, already there's a new energy coming into the world the paradigmatic image of this crisis is all those online images of people finding ways to sing and dance together across distance. Locked in a vacancy, entombed for four days or 14 days or more, we learn something about ourselves, or at least we are given the gift of that opportunity. Who are we? Who are the people other people want us to be, need us to be? How are other people, other forces, how have they had a hand in shaping us? We learn who we want to be and who we will choose to be. And that we are all in this together, more interconnected than we previously believed. We are our own breakfast club. We are the church. We are all one humanity. We are all God's beloved and uniquely beautiful children, worthy of the same respect and dignity. We have been given the gift of new life. What will we do with it? What will you do with it? Will you allow yourself to be changed? Will our old life, our old lives, be something we put behind us? Will we become transformed, locked in a vacancy? By the end of the movie, the five characters have a breakthrough and discover they are more complex, unique, and fully human than the one-dimensional stereotypes in the simplest terms and the most convenient definitions that have been placed upon them and that they have accepted as truth. They find out that there is at least a little bit of one another in each one of them. They are not so different, that they are all the brain, an athlete, a basket case, a princess, and a criminal. That they are all a Democrat and a Republican, an independent, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, and an atheist, gay, straight, man, woman, transgender, non-binary gender, white, black, Asian. They, we learn that we are so much more than how other people see us, how outside forces want us to see each other, and how we choose to see ourselves and our brothers and sisters. 
After this breakthrough, the brain character, Brian Johnson, asked the group the important question. So, so on Monday, what happens? Claire, the princess, says, are we still friends, you mean? If we're friends now, that is? And this is the question we must ask ourselves. So when this is all over, will we still care for one another, love one another, share our resource for, with one another? Will we still be friends? Brothers and sisters, what will we do? What will you do with the opportunity, the gift of new life that we are being given? What will we do? All I know is first we must unbind ourselves of our old grave clothes. And I don't mean our pajamas, sweats, and yoga pants. What will you do with your new life? Because life goes on. And we, you, have a choice. Life goes on. And to God alone be all the glory. Amen. join me now as we bow our heads and lift our hearts to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we are overflowing with emotions today. Some we understand and others we do not. And with this overabundance of feelings comes an overabundance of reactions as well. Hear our prayers this day. We are feeling anxious and afraid. We fear for our lives and our livelihoods, our family and friends, our children and our neighbors and our colleagues. In this fearfulness, we strive for control, rigidity, and perfection. In our anxiety, we lash out at the powers that be. We complain about how others are behaving, or we simply fold in on ourselves, succumbing to despair. Help us to manage our anxieties 
and tamp down these fears that we might carry on in these uncertain days with the certainty that you are with us in it all. We are feeling confined and getting bored. We know that we are meant to live in community and the isolation that is so necessary right now is difficult. We crave another person's touch, a casual conversation about nothing at all, and the comfort of our peers at school and at work. Too much time on our hands has not meant time for rest and renewal, but an increase of overthinking and perseveration. Calm our hearts, gracious God, and bring us to accept this time as a gentle reminder of your precious care of all your creation. We are feeling lonely and abandoned. We wonder why we haven't had a phone call from a particular person, or if others are getting more phone calls than we do. We are painfully aware that our circle has grown smaller, and we are not even sure who we could reach out to. We miss those chance connections of our everyday lives with the hairdresser or the grocery store clerk. Cradle us now in the palm of your hand and hold us close in this grief. Help us to reach out and connect in any way we can that everyone might be comforted. And we are feeling a deep sense of gratitude and awe. We are thankful for healthcare workers of every kind, those on the front lines and those working far behind the scenes. We pray for their safety and resilience and courage. We are grateful for essential services still available to us, for delivered groceries and drive through restaurants and online banking. We pray for the health of each person working to keep our society functioning as best it can and the ability of anyone who needs to be home for their own safety or for the health of someone close to them. Keep us ever mindful of sacrifices being made on our behalf and help us to offer our prayers of praise and thanksgiving even in a time of apprehension and discomfort. Holy God, assist us in understanding our emotions and our reactions and help us to rest in the sure knowledge that you guide us powerfully through all our days. Bring health to the suffering, comfort to those who are in grief, courage to all of us for the living of these days. May we each see a glimpse of your glory in the budding of a flower, in the sun through our windows, in the voice of a friend, and in the memory of a happier time. We ask this today in the sweet and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, for over 70 years, the one great hour of sharing offering has provided Presbyterians with a way to share God's love with our neighbors in need all around the world. Typically received during this season of Lent, this special offering supports three programs in our denomination, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and Self-Development of People. From initial disaster response, to ongoing community development, the work of these three fit together to provide people with safety, sustenance, and hope. 
To donate to this offering, you may mail a check to the church with one great hour of sharing on the memo line. Or you can donate online through our website at fpcssp.org. Just click on the donations button, choose missions from the drop down menu, and indicate one great hour of sharing in the memo line. This year, the Presbyterian Church USA has an overarching theme for its special offerings of We Are the Church. Please enjoy this video clip of the Director of Special Offerings for our denomination while you prayerfully consider your gift. Special Offerings for the Presbyterian Church USA. And for the last couple of years, we've been engaging uh, the overarching theme for Special Offerings about We Are the Church together. And that comes from a children's hymn that's near and dear to my heart. And so at this present moment, uh, we wanted you to know as the church, we are indeed together. We're praying for one another. We're trying to stand with one another and help the most vulnerable. So um, as part of that, as part of a gift, as part of our prayer, uh, Dr. Bill McConnell, Mission Engagement Advisor for the Presbyterian Mission Agency has joined me. And we're going to sing a few verses of We Are the Church together. church you are the church we are the church together all who follow jesus all around the world yes we're the church together the church is not a building the church is not a steeple the church is not a resting place the church is a people i am the church you are the church we are the church together, all who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. We're many kinds of people with many kinds of faces, all colors and all ages, too, from all times and places. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. church together and when we cannot gather they're still singing they're still praying they're still laughing and there's crying too and all of it saying i am the church you are the church we are the church together going to join into and our last hymn, which should be seen in just a amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Please join me and sing loudly. Oh, 
what will we do? What will you do with this amazing gift of new life? When the winter of this COVID-19 time is over, what will you do? Who will you be when the new life of spring arrives? Will we still care for each other? Will we still reach out to one another? Will we still love each other? Will we still be friends? What will you do with this amazing gift of new life? And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide in you from this day forward and forevermore. Amen.